Today's interview is with Adam Balsinger. Um, Adam is an entrepreneur at heart. Um, and he realized this pretty early on, he, he said. Um, and he's tried a few different niches in real estate investing. Um, he started out flipping, still is wholesaling and has had a lot of success with that, but also is now a multifamily syndicator um, and is growing that business as well. So really interesting interview today. So stick around for all of that great stuff. Hello and welcome to Wrestling with Real Estate, where we look to chunk slam all your real estate problems. I'm your host, former WWE wrestler and now Cirque du Soleil performer, and of course, multifamily real estate investor, Barry Griffiths. Now, today we're joined by Adam Bessinger. Did I butcher your surname there or not? My bad. I, I'm the Balsinger. worst. Balsinger. Balsinger, yeah. You were like, you were right there, man. <laughs> you good. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, hey, man, I'm glad we got time to connect and got to hop on the call. Um, I'm excited. excited. Yeah, me too. To dive into the conversation will be a fun one. No doubt about that. Um, but yeah, I start- was totally thrown off by your intro. I was like, holy <laughs> crap. Like, I hope that I'm not expected to like equal that energy because like, your, your, your uh, you know, listeners are going to be disappointed. <laughs> I figure if I can just set the bar like really low, then yeah. it's going to be a great episode. <laughs> You're going to be awesome regardless, man. And that's all I got. That's all I say. I got a bit of energy and that's about it. You got to do what you got. You, you got to do what you can with what little you have, right? So I'm trying my best <laughs> with that. Uh, but you want to sort of introduce yourself to everyone, let them know more about you and what you've been up to. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Adam Balsinger. Uh, I've been a full-time real estate investor for about seven-ish years, something like that. I'm horrible with remembering dates. It's six, eight, seven, I don't know, something like that. And, um, you know, I, I've run two different real estate businesses right now, or I'm involved in two different real estate businesses. Um, I live currently in uh, the Charlotte, North Carolina area. I have a multifamily syndication business here with two partners. Um, Charles and Wayne, and we focus on BNC assets and BNC areas in the Southeast United States, primarily the Carolinas, and we've kind of crept down into Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I also then, I'm from Philadelphia, and so I have a, um, um, a wholesaling business in the Philadelphia area with one other partner, and we're going on four years in that business actually started out doing fix and flips and that kind of morphed itself and evolved into a wholesaling business over time. Uh, so I've done a lot. I mean, I've done like, you know, a lot of different things within real estate and a lot of them I did not do very well. Uh, so the fix and flip game was, well, I was not very good at that. Um, you know, I built up a small portfolio. Uh, I had about 18 doors, single families, like duplexes and triplexes. And the money that, that we were expecting to, to be bringing in each month just was not there. Uh, the headache was definitely there <laughs> more so than we anticipated. And so that was kind of what led to um, the large multifamily and, and, and going the syndication route. Yeah, that's interesting that you, you've done with a, f- a few different ones. And I feel like a lot of successful people, they do, right? And you find your niche eventually, you find what suits you and what you're trying to do. And that's the cool thing about real estate as well, is that you have all these different options, right? You don't just have to do one thing. You can do try a few different ones and find which ones works. You also said before we off, off air that <clears throat> straight out of college, you were trying all these entrepreneurial stuff, right? You're quite the entrepreneur, right? You tried different stuff and all that. Where did that come from, you think? Because I don't think it's in all of us, right? especially right out of college like that uh that dude that's a great question um so you know like my i come from like a a really great upbringing like great family life you know kind of middle class uh like upper middle class i I don't know um but so you know i grew up outside of philadelphia in the total boonies like i'm talking cow pasture across the street from my house right so a lot of the people that I grew up with, you know, their parents didn't really do much. Um, you know, they, they had great jobs. They were great people. Um, but, you know, they, they were definitely not like high up on the socioeconomic scale. Right. So my parents were actually some of the more successful um, in kind of the, the circle that I ran with. Right. My mom was a school teacher. Uh, my dad wound up by the time he retired, he was um, CFO for a company named Pet Value International, which was like the third largest pet retail chain uh, in the States behind PetSmart and Petco. Um, you know, not like, again, like middle class, right? 
they were actually the first two to put themselves through school. Um, you know, first for, first member of each respective family that went to college. Um, but so, you know, I say that to say that like, we never really needed for anything. I was able to go on like a lot of cool trips and stuff. Um, but at the same time, like my parents worked a lot, um, a lot, you know, and they, while, while I think they enjoyed, you know, what they did to a certain extent, I, I really don't think that either one of them were, were super duper passionate about like waking up and like loving going to work every day, right? They didn't hate it, but it, it's not like, you know, it was like somewhere in, in between. Um, but the thing that I think stood out to me the most was that they were, they were kind of like captives of their jobs, right? And um, I never really wanted to do that. Uh, especially if it was something that I didn't like really love. I remember as a kid, dude, like always being envious of the other kids that like knew they wanted to be a doctor or an architect or, a or whatever. It was just the fact that they knew that I was like, cool, man. Good for you. That's a good for you. I have no idea like what I want. Um, so I went to college. I just did business because that made sense um, to me that to, to go business route. Um, I studied marketing um, just cause I hated the finance stuff. Like I actually started out as a finance major and changed it. And so, you know, I was really just looking for a job when I got out of school and, you know, as a, as a marketing major, I thought like, Oh, I'll make the funny Budweiser commercials. <laughs> and when I was growing up, like the Super Bowl was like the Budweiser commercials with the frogs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember um, that one. So I'm like, you know, kid coming out of college, like I'm going to get this cool advertising job, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I like even entry level marketing jobs, you needed sales experience for. And I was like, I didn't really want to be in sales, but I felt like I kind of had to. So I got started, um, you know, I was interviewing, interviewing, looking for all these jobs, nothing really like that I really felt that great or passionate about. And I remember the, the, the company that I wound up working for, I was just super impressed by the woman that interviewed me. She was like this mid to late 20s um chick just had it together you could tell like super confident just like you know owned it right and she ran the company and it was a direct sales business they were selling for verizon i had no idea what i was even going to do when they invited me back on the second interview like you know it was so fast the interview i'm like you know worried that like i don't have stuff on my shirt or whatever <laughs> and so the interview it may as well have been five seconds for all i remembered um, so, you know, I just remembered being really impressed by her. She got started, um, in the same entry level position that I had been er interviewing for. And they just talked a lot about freedom and, and growth and the ability to make significant income. Uh, and those things really resonated with me. And then the more that I was involved in that business, the more that they were talking about control and attitude and being able to determine your own trajectory in life. And that stuff like really resonated with me. And so I, dude, it was just being around people that, that lived it and talked it and, and backed it up. And I just got kind of like addicted to it after a while. Yeah, well, that's cool. And it's when you were talking there, it makes me think of, you know, like entrepreneurs always say, right, I'd rather work 100 hours for myself and 40 hours for someone else, right? It's kind of that, that mindset, right? Even though you might be working more, you're working for yourself and you're, you're in control somewhat of, 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 of that work that you have to, to, to yeah. do. So, yeah. so what did and, you do? Did you, know, you try like, it? Not having Go to ahead, answer sorry. anybody it was, was something like I've always been kind of um, like anti authority. You know, like I got in a lot of trouble when I was a kid growing up. So I was a knucklehead and I was always, you know, running around. So like the authoritarian figure, you know, I, I never wanted to have to like answer to the man. It just like, ugh, it like kind of gives me the willies. <laughs> so then when you found real estate, was that like, <clears throat> like a moment where you're like, wow, this is kind of everything I'm looking for all rolled into one? Um. Oh. You know, honestly, man, like, I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, you're just trying stuff as, mm -hmm. as you go, you know, somebody said to me a while ago, a couple of years ago, like the truest definition of an entrepreneur is somebody that jumps off a cliff and figures out how to build the airplane, like on the way down. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so when I started my sales business, 
So like, I'm not like an IT guy. I'm not a programmer. I'm not super duper creative. So to me, like the business, whatever it was going to be that I was going to run had to be something that was, um, I wanted it simple and I wanted it um, repeatable or replicable, right? And so sales is that. You learn how to sell something once and dude, you can do it for like ad infinity as long as you just talk to enough people and present your, your solution to enough people, right? Um, so I got burned out of, of my sales business that I ran and I, I went and kind of like tail between my legs and, and just picked up a couple jobs here in sales, selling stuff for different people. And I was kind of always like, I really think like in the back of my mind, I was just like licking my wounds until, you know, I, that was healed up enough for me to, to be willing to give it another go. And dude, somewhere along the line, I, I kind of got interested in real estate. Um, I, I actually, so I remember the thing that really like made it something that I, I definitely wanted to pursue. I was living in, Ch in Chicago at the time and I was renting from a guy who had bought a house from like the little old lady and he turned it into four by level three bed two bath apartments and the rent that i was paying was like 2000 or like 2200 bucks and and this is going back like 2011 2012 wow. probably um and so you know he had four of those so this guy had one quad bringing in like eight grand a month i have no idea like what his nut was on on the note um but i took him out to lunch and was just like explain this to me you know like what like is is this what you do for a living like how did like i don't get it right and so he kind of explained to me, you know, oh, you know, this is my business. You know, we buy properties like these and, and we renovate them and keep them and some we sell and some we hold. And uh, so from that point on, just the idea of being able to kind of be your own boss, um, investing in real estate, you know, supply and demand, like you're never going to have a concern over running out of demand, you know, Um so yeah, and then it just became a matter of like, well, how the heck do you, do, do you even make this work? Like I had never even really thought about it until then. And then, you know, the house flipping shows started to get to be really popular. And I was like, that's it. Like, I'm going to flip houses just like, you know, whoever it was on TV. And so that's kind of how the whole, the whole thing got, got started. That's pretty cool. And you started in flipping. What, what was it about flipping that didn't work out for you, think? Um, so first of all, I, I really don't think that I was like ready to be, um, a, a true successful business owner. You know, I mean, I think that there's different, there's different ways that people mature and, you know, I was not ready from like a leader perspective. Um, you know, I, I anyway, so I just wasn't mature enough at that stage. And so that was one thing, but I also, um, you know, so dealing with contractors for anybody who has ever flipped a house, uh, is a very, uh, frustrating experience to put it mildly. Um, you know, you're going into it thinking like, okay, you know, I vetted seven different contractors this is the one like i've gotten all these bids and this one actually makes sense and i feel like it's fair and i'm not being bent over and we've got a contract and they have insurance and they've been in business for three years and all of this stuff right and then they screw you over anyway and it it felt to me like i was constantly trying to sell the contractor on why they needed to do their job Right. And it pissed me off. Um, I feel like, and I might be wrong about this. I think we all tend to think probably a little more highly of ourselves than, than what actually we are. Right. But, you know, if there's one thing about me that I, that I really believe, I think that I do what I say I'm going to do. And I really, and, and if I can't, I, I really do my absolute best to, to deliver on my word because that's my word, right? And, you know, it was just kind of the way that I was raised. And it just felt like contractors were, 
you know, half of them were like shysters and the other had, you know, a quarter of them like had gotten out of, out of, out of prison and couldn't get a job anywhere else. And they were like, I'm just going to become a contractor. <laughs> um, so there were just so many times, man, where, where we got hosed with contractors and it was a battle. And I think, um, I had one contractor that was able to do three jobs in a row for me. And every other time it was like, I was juggling contractors and subs and stuff. And I absolutely hated it. Um, so maybe that was me. Maybe, it, you know, I have no idea, but um, you know, that challenge. And because we had such a challenge with contractors, we had a lot of difficulty just simply doing enough volume in order to make really good money doing it. So like I was making some money flipping houses. We were doing, you know, five, six, seven a year or something like that. Um, so, you know, wasn't setting the world on fire by any stretch of the imagination. I also like wasn't homeless, like living on my parents' couch. Um, you know, it was kind of somewhere in between, but actually coincidentally, what led to my wholesaling business was you know, I had tried all these different means of, of doing more deals. And, you know, I GC'd our own projects for a year and had um, just guys that I hired kind of directly under that I was managing, thinking we'll save money on construction and we'll be able to then do more deals. That didn't work. Um, we saved money, but it took longer for us to do the job. So it wound up being kind of like six of one, half dozen of the other. And I was constantly like running to Home Depot and Lowe's and the bank because I had to pay the guys in cash because of course none of them had bank. Like it was just like a nightmare. Um, so that didn't work. And then I had been, I, I tried buying at, at tax sales and, and foreclosure auctions and um, you know, that didn't really help us do much more volume. And I had bought a couple of deals off of wholesalers and remembered thinking like, you know, some of these guys and, and gals like aren't the sharpest tools in the shed, you know, like if they can do this, like there's, it can't be that difficult. Right. So I wound up investing in doing some direct marketing campaigns. And the whole idea was to feed my own fix and flip um, business. And I wound up getting a couple of leads that just made more sense to wholesale. Um, limped through some wholesale deals. My first one, I made like less than $500. Um, Barry, get this. So the buyer was arrested and in jail and I had to get power of attorney for his mom to buy the property on his behalf, go to his bank, take out cash. Like it was a literal cash deal. Like there, <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> I made like $470 or something on the deal. It was obnoxious. Um, <laughs> But I wound up, you know, I, I don't know, probably third, fourth wholesale deal. I, I had put up a bandit sign, you know, those we buy houses signs and did like a 30K wholesale deal that was like a piece of cake. And from that point, I was like, that's it. I'm like, no dealing with contractors. I don't even have to borrow. Like, I don't have to come up with the cash to, to take the property down. Like, this is amazing, right? And then so kind of, you know, had a couple rehabs that needed to be finished up or whatever. And so, but that was kind of the point that was the light bulb that made me want to go into, into wholesaling. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, Cause you, like you said as well, right, with wholesaling, you, there are costs and there are headaches, but it's not the same as flipping, right? Cause you know, you just find the deal, <clears throat> you find, find a buyer and you put them together and then you make your fee, right? It's just sort of. Oh dude, it's a whole other set of headaches. <laughs> I wish it was that. It's, so like one of my mentors <clears throat> said that, you know, wholesaling is simple mm -hmm. because it's just what you said, right? You market, you find people that are in distress or motivated, you negotiate the deal, you find the sell, the buyer, boom, done. Um, but it's not easy uh, because there's a zillion things that can go wrong and uh, a lot of times do go wrong. Today, we title company was supposed to show up at 930. Uh, seller calls my partner at 945. Mind you, seller is blind. So seller has a power of attorney and an attorney that um, we're working with throughout this whole process. And so we did a, a mobile closing title company goes to the seller's house, attorney, power of attorney are there. Everybody's ready at 930. The title company like forgot that they were supposed to go there. So we reach out to the title company. My partner reached out to the title company and it's like, um, where are you? You know, that you're late. 
we are we're, they're late like oh my gosh so they showed up the title company didn't get there until like 11 30 12 30 so the seller the power of attorney and the attorney were sitting there for two to three hours waiting for the title company to show up and you can imagine how excited and happy they all were right so it's just you know it's just a whole other can of worms that you open up like no business you know all business has their challenges um, and all business to a certain extent, I think is hard. Otherwise, everybody would be a successful entrepreneur. There's a reason that what, what are the statistics like 90% of businesses go out of business in the first year, just because it's not, it's not super easy. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, so when, where, where or when did multifamily come in? Yeah, dude, great question. So, you know, the whole idea with the, with the transactional real estate, whether it was fix and flips or wholesaling was stack cash buy rentals, right? Mm -hmm. That was the idea for me. That was the path to financial freedom um, and time freedom. So, you know, wound up with a portfolio of, I think I mentioned before, like 18 doors, um, single family, duplex, two triplexes, couple, you know, whatever. And it was just the money wasn't there, you know, between you, like, you, you go on bigger pockets and like the Burr method, like, oh, it's great, right? And don't get me wrong, the Burma method is a good strategy, but you're not becoming financially free in a reasonably short period of time at all by employing the Burr method. Like you have a buttload of debt and you're making a hundred, two hundred dollars per door. Well, I don't know about you, man, but like 10, like I'm trying to live my life you know i don't want to be financially free like clipping freaking coupons you know like shopping it like you know whatever like i want to be able to travel and eat where i want to eat not have to worry about like oh let me check my bank account before i make this purchase so just do the vo the sheer volume if you're burring um like thousand doors like thousands of doors right in order to be financially free and i used to joke with my my now wife like i'm gonna be dead by the time I have enough of these for us to be financially free. Um, so, you know, I, I really believe in real estate as a wealth building vehicle and as a means of generating significant amounts of passive income to allow, you know, you to live the lifestyle that you want. Um, but to me, you know, buying um, income properties like one door, two door, three doors at a time was just the slow road. And I didn't want to take the slow road. So it then became a question of, okay, well, how do I do this at scale where I can, I can acquire more doors faster. And that's where uh, multifamily syndication came from. Like, dude, I didn't even re I, like never even crossed my mind. Like, Oh, I'll just go buy a hundred unit property with other people's money. Like no problem. Right. Um, it, it was totally like, oh, you know, like mind blown when, when I learned that that was how they did it, how people did it. It's basically a gigantic fix and flip or a gigantic burr. It's just that you're, you're pulling a bunch of people together in order to take the deal down and get it done rather than like tapping your one private lender to do it. Right. It's, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's just bigger. Um, so I, I think that I also think it's more fun, like dealing with those bigger deals, you know, it's just, they're harder to get. There's, there's more moving parts to it, but, um, the thrill is kind of in the chase a little bit, you know, at least for me it is. Yeah. And some people might argue it's actually easier to manage a hundred unit property than a duplex. You know what I mean? A duplex, you either manage it yourself or you have some property management company that you know are not the most sophisticated in the world right you get a hundred unit property you're going to get hopefully a good third, third party property management on site handyman on site um someone on payroll on site management you know all those things and it just makes it a lot easier now there's a lot more moving paths but also you have partners that do it right it's very rare that someone takes a hundred unit debt property down by themselves so it's it's a lot more attainable than I think than people realize. I'm not saying it's easy, for sure it's not easy, but it's a lot more attainable than people realize. Yeah, and, and I think that, that you hit on the thing that a lot of people don't really take into account appropriately when they're getting into rental real estate. A lot of people are like, oh, just hire a property manager, no big deal. 
right? You get a much different caliber of property manager on a hundred unit property than you do a single family house. Like it's, I've done both enough to really believe that I can say that and, and fully believe it to be totally 100% true. Um, you know, you're just dealing with it. It's just a more professional, you don't have to hold their hand quite as much. Um, you know, you get economies of scale. So if you need to do major renovations, you can get everything for cheaper. You can get your chamber and your labor cheaper because you just, it's all there. You're, you're doing it all at one time. And then you have, then, you know, if you have like our 92 unit property, there's, I think 18 buildings. So like when it's time to replace roofs, I replace 18 roofs instead of 92 roofs. So the roofs are bigger, right, on, on the 18. But like when you're talking about the overall cost to maintain um, an equal portfolio, uh, you know, number of doors, it's so much easier from an economies of scale perspective on the multifamily side than it is um, the individual house side of things. And then what are the chances I would have 92 homes in a compressed geographical area you know, I'm, I'm going to be paying more for the property management. Um, so you just, you get better margins, I think a lot in, in the multifamily space. Yeah, for sure. Like you, like you talked about the economies of scale are huge with multifamily. I think <clears throat> what was the, so what was the first deal that you, you guys partner up, you partner up with, uh, with, uh, Wayne and Charles, uh, yeah. I know Charles pretty well. And I don't know you, you know, who is Wayne as well. You might want to divulge that. Yeah, so Wayne, <laughs> Wayne's my dad, uh, the CFO that I mentioned before. Yeah. So, you know, he and I, from when I had first started my very, when I had started my very first business, I remember my dad, a lot of times had talked about kind of wanting to do his own thing. Um, and never did it, never pulled the trigger. And so when I started running my sales business, we would talk a lot when we would get together for the holidays. Cause I was, you know, I was in Detroit and Chicago, like I was all over the place. Um, and so we would talk about going into business together. And so, you know, going into real estate together made a lot of sense. His career was winding down. He was going to have more free time. And like, I am not a numbers person. I alluded to that before I mentioned that I had, you know, I, my first major was actually finance and I did an internship that was accounting and I hated it. I used to fall asleep at the computer, like literally like trying to like hold my eyeballs open, right. <laughs> to stay awake at the computer. So I changed majors because I just, I, I just couldn't, I like, I just didn't like it. Um, so, you know, having somebody that is my own flesh and blood. I can trust him. And he also is, you know, you're talking about a CFO CPA, like the guy's like a whiz when it comes to, to numbers and projections and, and, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. So, um, it wound up being a really, really good fit there. And, um, you know, Charles is, is a really good fit for us as well. Charles has phenomenal follow through and is really good at kind of, you know, if you, if you look at the big picture, right? Like I'm big picture guy. Um, I like the 30,000 foot view. I like the, the direction. I like the creative problem solving. Um, I like that kind of stuff, right? Uh, marketing, like that kind of stuff I like. Um, but kind of putting it all together is, is really not a strength of mine. And I think that that's a, something that Charles is really good at. Um, and so, I was a little bit more strategic in the way that, that we um, structured the multifamily business because I had already gotten through, kind of going through the challenges with the wholesaling business. My, my partner in, our, in my wholesaling business is very similar to me from a personality standpoint. Um, we both like doing a lot of the same things. We also uh, both don't like doing a lot of the same things. So when there's something that has to be done and we go, okay, who's doing that? And it's like crickets on the phone. And it's like, all right, well, like, I guess I'll do it. And then you better believe that's like a three month thing before whatever it is that gets done, gets done because neither one of us really wants to do it. We just, you know, suck it up to do it. So, you know, I realized that I needed to, I think, do a better job of, of finding somebody that would offset my weaknesses with their own strengths in 
the syndication business. I think we've done a really good job of that this time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you touched on something so important then that when you, any kind of partnership, right, it's so important that you have someone that, uh, um, that, that that can find the stuff that you don't like to do interesting. Like they like to do the stuff that you don't do and you, you like to do the stuff that they don't like to do so that you, you know, you fit together like a jigsaw puzzle and it just works, yeah. works a lot better. But, the yin to your yang, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So what was, <clears throat> what was the first deal that you guys did? Uh, so the very, so I, um, my dad and I actually did two deals um, as passive LP investors um, first, but I'll skip. So by the way, I think that there's a lot of value for people, um, you know, any of your listeners who are trying to get into this indication space, I think there's insane value in investing as an LP before you do your own deal, because you just don't know what you don't know. So it's an opportunity to have some skin in the game. If you're anything like me, if you're invested in something, you pay more attention to it than if you're just like researching it, right? Because like you literally have money invested. Um, so I, I totally would recommend doing that. Um, but the very first deal that we did was a 92 unit property in Stone Mountain, Georgia, which is just outside of Atlanta. So it's part of the Atlanta MSA. Um, and believe it or not, um, we didn't even find it. So we had been working with a potential KP, key principal sponsor um, out of Atlanta, uh, a guy named Steve. We actually, my dad and I invested in one of his deals as LP. So one of those two LP investments was with this guy, Steve, another benefit, right? Build a stronger relationship. And then that helps as you're going to do your own deals. Uh, but so, you know, we, we kept putting stuff in front of him. We were in a couple of highest and best rounds and, you know, just things just didn't work out. Um, and he, I think he was up to about 1500 or so doors at the time and his market again is Atlanta. So he knew of this deal and just called us up and said, Hey guys, like, I'm not really looking at 92 unit properties right now, but I know the area, um, you know, if you underwrite it and you think it looks like a good deal, you know, I'll partner with you. I'll sponsor on it. And so we said, okay, cool. Well, let's take a look. Right. And, uh, that wound up then becoming our very first deal. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, going back to what you're talking about investing as an LP, there's so many benefits, right? So many benefits. One, you get a, uh, if you find a good group, hopefully you get mm -hmm. a return on your money, right? You're involved, you're investing in real estate because that's what you're doing. You're not buying stocks. You're not buying <clears throat> cryptocurrency. You're, you're getting the benefits of real estate. You're owning a small portion of that large multifamily, right? You're getting the tax benefit, you're getting appreciation, you're getting the debt pay down, you're getting the cash flow, you're getting all that stuff, but also you're learning as you alluded to, and you don't know what you don't, don't know to start off with. So you see how they underwrite, you see how they report, yep. you see how they handle adversity, all that good stuff. Right. And then on top of that, you get access to these people, right? People ask me how, how do I find a GP? How do I <clears throat> find these people to help me? Simple, invest in one of the deal. Who's not going to take money, right? They're all, all GPs are looking for money, right? You know, there's an abundance of money more, more than ever right now, but still everyone is always looking for money. And if you invest money in a deal, they're going to give you more time. They're going to build that relationship and that paid off for you guys, right? And I'm not saying that everyone's going to get a 92 unit from, from investing in LP, but it definitely helped what you guys did. So that was cool. What was, um, yeah, what, and what, sorry, well, go ahead. To, to even take it a step further. So the second deal that my dad and I invested in as LPs, um, the, the operator on that deal is now our sponsor on our other two syndications. So we've done three to date. Um, and each, like literally the sponsor on all of them um, are from the two passive investments that my dad and I did. Wow. See, see that <laughs> it's just the power of relationships, right? Just being involved and being in the business and the, yep. being an LP is a great way to build those relationships, no doubt. Um, totally. What was what, what did you guys like about that first deal? What, what, what penciled out about it? What, what looked good about it? Um, so I'm sure that every group says this to their <laughs> Does it start um, with a C? Does it start with a C? It does. And it ends with... <laughs> Conservatives, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we really think that we're, we're pretty conservative. And so, you know, the, the, so the first deal that we closed was September, 2019. And the kind of rumblings or grumblings across the industry at that point was, you know, Hey, we're like, this is a really long expansionary cycle. 
when is there going to be a plateau or a downturn? So it was like the elephant in the room, right? Uh, and so everybody was expecting so, like the shoe to drop. And so one of the things that we were really reluctant to do was to buy something that was going to require a really strenuous um, physical value add because we just viewed that as being additional risk in the deal. You know, if you're taking a property that is, uh, you know, C class and you're converting it to B, you're talking about putting all brand new tenants into that asset. And so we just felt like, you know, hey, look, if there's if there's potential for a downturn, we don't want to take that risk right now. So this deal just for whatever reason was one of those ones where the um, current owner had not done a good job of maximizing um, the value of the property. So we were able to, we, we were projecting that we could push rents by a hundred to two hundred dollars a door uh, with literally just a slightly upgraded unit turn. Uh, and this is like, we're talking like lighting fixtures, like nothing else. Right. And it was just because, you know, it was a C area. And I think what a lot of, a lot of operators do is they get tied up in this value add, value add, value add into them. They're thinking like sink money into it, upgrade the units. And so, uh, we were actually just looking at a really good example of what I'm talking about right now. It's a C-class property in Charlotte, C-class area, and they have granite, shaker brand new shaker white cabinets um and stainless steel appliances in the unit uh in the units and nothing in the neighborhood has that sort of finishes to it so they are looking at pretty good occupancy levels because they have the nicest units in the area but they're not hitting the rents that they thought that they were going to hit just because the area just doesn't justify it right like nobody's moving in there and paying $300 more because they have brand account. You know what I'm saying? Like, so there's, you know, I think something to be conscious of for your listeners is not over renovating. You know, a lot of times if you're in a C property, like you really just, you need to provide something that's clean and safe and quiet and in good operating and functioning condition. Um, and that's what we were able to do there. Uh, so we were able to cut some expenses. They had too many, they had way too much staff on site as well. Um, so we were able to, to reduce some of the expenses, push the rents organically without uh, a significant capital outlay. So that was one of the things that we really liked about it. But, um, <clears throat> what was, what were the biggest challenges with that first deal? You know, as a new group, I know you guys had a partner, so maybe that negated it, but did you find any challenges being a newer group in, in, in doing a syndication? Yeah. Yeah. We didn't think we were or like, we did not feel like we were so nervous like two weeks leading up to it that we were not going to hit the raise so you know i think that a lot of groups go in underestimating the difficulty in raising capital um and so we were guilty of that too you know we should have started raising way earlier um and we we learned a lot of lessons through that that first deal and so that, but that was the challenge was, oh my God, are we going to have enough money? Are we going to be able to close this deal? Uh, and so it was really all hands on deck and, and we, we were able to get fully funded prior to close. Uh, so everything worked out really well, but uh, it, we were all very stressed, uh, you know, leading up to it, like the 10th hour, the 11th hour. Um, so, so that was the challenge was the capital raise. Yeah, and, and then fast forward now to where you are, guys are now. How many units do you guys have now between the three so deals? So we're, we're th uh, three uh, deals, 204 units, about 15, 16 million in assets under management. Wow, well, congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, uh, what's next for you guys? Um, well, so the most immediate goal is a thousand doors. So, you know, uh, initially the, the thought was that we wanted to hit that goal this year. Um, you know, we'll see how that goes. The space is super duper competitive right now, as you know. So, um, you know, that might be a little aggressive with how competitive things are and, and where we are, um, you know, in the year so far. Um, but it's continuing to really grow the, uh, the syndication business. I want to continue to grow the wholesale business. Um, you know, we're, we're doing really well there, but, you know, I think 
for any any of the entrepreneurs that are listening in, listening in, it's always like, okay, how do we do this bigger? How do we do this better? Um, or how do we do this at the same volume with requiring less of my time? So I'm working on those two things simultaneously with both companies, really. Yeah, great, great. Well, man, it's a uh, fun to talk to you, man. We, we, we've known each other a little bit now for a while, and it's just good to get on a call with you and talk to you and hear your story. Yeah. But um, as this show is called Wrestling with Real Estate, I like to incorporate some wrestling related real estate questions. And the first one is what would your wrestling name be? Uh, so I've been thinking about that, right? Uh, I would say the macro. Okay. The macro would be my name. The, the reason behind that? Because uh, so I, I think that's what I'm good at, right? I think that I, I'm a high level person. Uh, and so I think it would be the macro. And I even, it, my, my entrance song <laughs> would be Pink Floyd Money. And it would start <laughs> out with the cha-ching, cha-ching part, right? With the cash register. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So every that's wrestling, right. uh, the macro. That's a 1B. That's like <laughs> bonus points. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't, you're the first one per, uh, person to suggest an entrance music, I think. So I like that. Maybe I should add that question, actually. But um, there you uh, go. Uh, every wrestler has a special move. What is your special move in real estate? Uh, so, you know, I, I, I've alluded to it, right? I think that um, I'm kind of the macro guy. Um, so, but more as it relates to real estate, I, I think that I'm pretty good at explaining things. Um, so I am like our investor relations person, right? So, um, you know, I'm the person that's speaking to investors. Uh, you know, I'm the one doing a lot of the investor presentations. So, in those investor presentations, I'm talking more about the deal itself, what we like about it, right? Charles is involved in those. He's going over the numbers. Um, but I, I, so I used to sell stuff door to door. Uh, that's that first business. It was door to door. It was B2B. It was cold calling. It was commission only. And so I could be in the hood um, or I could be like knocking on like a $4 million property. Um, trying to sell them internet, phone, and television service, like the least sexy thing that you can possibly <laughs> imagine, right? Yeah. And so I feel like I got really good at being able to relate to people, kind of disarm people, and paint a clear picture um, using examples, things that people can relate to, right? So I, I think that's my, that would be my special move. Very cool. What, uh, what's been your biggest body slam you've taken in real estate? Um, so there were a couple fix and flips that were pretty brutal in, in the, the early stages. Uh, I actually wound up buying a, a property that we had done, um, and living there and kind of fixing some stuff up over time. Um, you know, I, I basically, we, we kind of broke even as a company I had been renting when I had moved back to Philadelphia. So um, you know, it was probably not in hindsight, the smartest move in the world. Uh, we probably should have just, you know, finished it up the right way and, and taken the loss on the deal, but we didn't really have the ability to do that at the time. So, um, I bought it. We, we kind of like made, made a couple bucks on the deal. And then I, uh, you know, finished up stuff, fixed up stuff, um, you know, over, over time as I moved there and lived there. Right. So it wasn't too bad. It didn't end up being too bad, I guess, in the end. Hopefully. Uh, oh no, it was brutal. Oh, <laughs> it, was, it was brutal. I'm just making it sound not that bad. <laughs> so was there a moment that you were standing on the top rope getting ready to jump, but you were too scared? What was it and how did you overcome it? It happens all the time, like literally all the time, um, especially now. So I, I think, right, you, as you grow, as a person, as a business person, every kind of level up, you, you encounter that, that, that fear, um, that self-limiting belief, that doubt, that wonder if what you're doing is right. Um, and so, you know, eventually you, you make the jump and you kind of, as you continue to do that more and more, you get more and more used to it. And then you find yourself with, with a new challenge. So, Dude, the first house that we bought as a fix and flip, petrified, terrified, right? 
the first wholesale deal that we ever did, terrified, right? Like, oh my God, what are we going to do if we can't perform? Uh, first rental property I ever bought, scared. Um, but I will say, as you go up in, in zeros that are attached to the property, it gets scarier. Uh, so, you know, the scariest was probably the very first multifamily deal that we did. Um, and now there's a whole nother element because, and, and you know this, it's becoming so common now because of how competitive the space is that you have to do hard money on day one. So that's like the next butt puckering thing that we're like, oh, I don't know if we're ready to do this, right? Like, what are we, are we going to, are we going to do hard money day one? Like, I don't know. What are we going to do? So that's, that's the next one right now. And uh, we, we haven't collectively made a decision that we are comfortable doing that yet. Um, so it's never ending, man. It's, it's every other day, it feels like. But that's the evolution of you as a person, right? If you don't, if you're not putting yourself in these positions, you're not evolving, you're not improving, you're not getting better, right? And it's Absolutely. a constantly challenge. And there's fun in that as well, to some extent, right? Especially when you overcome it, right? Once you get through it, there's a lot of fun to kind of jumping off that top rope as well, I think. Yeah, I, I remember. So I, I like self-development. I love that kind of stuff. And I remember, um, you know, I was, I was always kind of like a Tony Robbins fan. Right. And, and he's talking and I forget which program it even is. It's probably like personal power or whatever. And he's saying that, you know, as you grow and as you develop more confidence that you'll be in a room and there'll be a problem and everybody will be freaking out and you'll just step forward and say, everybody move. I got this. Right. <laughs> and so you kind of like can can feel that happening um, internally as you push yourself through more of these um, more of these stages, like you said, of that evolution, right? So it, it's, it winds up being pretty fun, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, man, thanks for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. That was a, a super fun conversation. But before we go, uh, do you want to tell people where they can find out more about you, how they can get in touch and all that good stuff? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm super passionate uh, about, you know, entrepreneurship, small business owners. I think that, you know, we really um, kind of are the foundation and the backbone of our country. Uh, and I know how difficult it can be to build a successful business. Uh, but then also, once you have a successful business, we spend so much time working that we're like, what are we doing with this cash? Right. And so a lot of times we don't have time to really figure out how to invest it, how best to build that nest egg. Uh, so we have an ebook uh, that we put together, my team and I. Um, so our website is www.investorboardroom.com. Uh, and you can get our free ebook, which is just investor boardroom uh, slash freedom. And that's a free resource that we have for people to uh, kind of learn how they can reach financial freedom through real estate. Very cool. Very cool. And I'll include the links to that in the, in the show notes. Well, Adam, thanks so much, man. Thanks for making the time. It was a fun conversation. I appreciate it. Barry, I appreciate you having me on. We got to link up when I'm in Vegas in a couple of weeks. For sure, man. For sure, man. But uh, Vegas. Woo! <laughs> I don't think I can keep up anymore, though. <laughs> Joke slam Vegas. <laughs>